Hi, welcome to the September 2014 Houston Clutter Coaching Meetup Group. Everybody say hi. Hi. I want you to know you're talking. I'm talking to people in the room. Tonight's topic is clutter hacks, tiny tricks that can make a big difference. I want to introduce you to Ed. Say hi. Hi, Ed. Ed's the guy that uh, maintains everything that you see, uh, the website and the meetup group and all that stuff. So we love him and we're grateful he's here. He uh, also makes this recording happen, thank God. I want to thank the Nature Discovery Center. We're in uh, Bel Air, Texas, which is inside Houston at the Nature Discovery Center. They let us use this fabulous room, which we enjoy so much. That is not true. Oh. <laughs> okay, so we are going to talk about tiny tricks, clutter hacks, tiny tricks that can make a big difference. Um, there's two kinds of organizing projects. There's the backlog part of the project where you're digging out chaos from previous disaster, right? The build-up part of the project. But that's a finite project and you get to the end of it. And then you have the maintenance phase, right? The part that you do to keep things, once you've organized it, the stuff that you do to keep it from getting back into chaos. So we're talking about the little maintenance tricks that you can do. And the trick is, you're trying to um, stanch the bleeding which I, look, I had to look up today to make sure I was saying that correctly. It's actually stanch the bleeding. Staunch is something else. I've been saying it wrong all this time, so I did verify myself today. <clears throat> you want to slow that process down. Even if, you're, so even if you're not done with the backlog, you want to be maintaining the spaces that you've already cleared, and these little tricks can help you. Even if you've done nothing with the backlog, you want to try to slow down the buildup and these little tricks can help you do that. And even if the whole idea of working on the backlog gives, makes you terrified, these tips can give you an experience of getting started in little bitty bits to sort of warm you into the process, ease you into the idea of doing your work. So they will work in all sorts of places, but I'm, I'm generally talking about maintenance mode. And you can use them anywhere. And I was just, I had another speech today and I was talking to people about how do you get started how, when you're overwhelmed completely and these little tips will work for that for sure. So let's get started. Tip number one, five minutes to handle the mail. We all have tons of mail, right? And I'm sure that any backlog project has their mail component where you have a stack of mail somewhere. But every day the mail's gonna come, you're gonna get your 10 pieces of mail, or your 20 pieces of mail, if you're really you know, popular, you get a whole lot. But 10 pieces of mail, six days down the road, six days in the week, you've got 60 pieces of mail. If you ignore it for a week, then you have a really big pile to deal with. But if you take five minutes when you come home to pick up the 10 pieces of mail and go stand over the trash and recycle, because eight of those 10 pieces are gonna go away, right? Just immediately. And then there's going to be a bill that you can go put in the bill station where you're keeping your bills. And there's going to be that new magazine that came, and you're going to go put that in the reading place. And then you're done. And you might have something you want to shred, right? Maybe of those 10 pieces, two pieces need to be shredded. You can go stand at the shredder, zip, zip, <coughs> and they're done. If you don't have a shredder, you can stand there and tear up two pieces of mail, and it won't take 20 seconds, right? It's worth the effort to make to, to deal with your mail every day because otherwise it doesn't take a second, a blink, and you have a big pile of mail to deal with, right? So this is a five minute maintenance that you can do that you really should build into your lifestyle just to prevent you from drowning under paper forever. <laughs> and people pay me a lot to come and dig through their boxes of mail where they've let the pile get big and then they sweep it into a box and go put it in the closet and then they pay me to take it out of the closet and open it up and take it out and throw it away. Which seems counterproductive to me, but I appreciate that, you know, that's how I make my living. But you don't have to pay me if you do five minutes a day, right, and deal with your mail. And do it, and I've said this a million times, do it before you sit on the couch, because once you're down for the count, then you're not getting back up, right? I know that's true for me, so I, you have to do it on the way in or it doesn't get done. Don't wait, don't wait. This is a funny one. Um, five minutes to unpack your bags. So we all go shopping. We come home with the groceries. 
the groceries you kind of have to put away because otherwise they die, right? If you don't put in the meat and you leave it on the counter, you know, three hours later you got some dead fresh meat, right? So um, you're kind of forced to do groceries. But most people that call me to work, I go into the closet or I go into a room in the office or there's this little stash of bags that have stuff in them still that they bought at the store and then brought home and didn't unpack. So it was like it was important enough to spend the money to have it, but once they got home it wasn't important enough to unpack. So then I get paid, thank goodness for my business model, to take people's stuff out of their bags and go put it where it's supposed to go. And that happens a lot. Like I, when I started this business, I was surprised by how many times I would unearth shopping extravaganzas still in the bag, still in the closet, or under the stairs, or in the corner of the kitchen, or on the table, and they'd been there for six months by the receipt that was still inside, right? So you have to add that five minutes onto your shopping trip, which includes coming home and unpacking your shopping. Put the new clothes in the closet, put the new piece of jewelry in the jewelry box, put the new you know, hardware things into the garage, whatever you need to do to get them out of the bag. But consider your shopping trip not complete until you go take those things out of the bag and put it away, right? It's a funny one that I was really surprised it might not happen a lot. Five minutes to pick up trash. Trash is an easy thing to ignore. And people that are not into clutter and sort of don't pay attention to clutter, they, can't, they sort of don't see the trash. <coughs> but if you make trash today, you open a package, you read the newspaper, you open some mail. If you make some trash today, today you know that it's trash because you just touched it. And if you spend five minutes today picking up the trash that you made in the house and put it in the trash, can, then it disappears forever. It goes away and you never have to look at that piece of whatever it is again. People unwrap, uncover, open, shred things on the way to completing a task. You do it in the kitchen, you open a package, you pour out the noodles, you're left with the package. And nine times out of ten I find that empty carton on the counter somewhere. And the spaghetti was from three weeks ago, right? But if you, if, if you have to do it as a discrete task and you have to think about it in order to pay attention, like when you're doing something, you're not paying attention to the trail of trash you're leaving behind. But if you make it a chore to go, okay, now I'm going to pick up today's trash and walk around and pluck all the stuff that you opened and left behind as you were executing whatever you were doing today, you can remove that trash today and not add to the existing pile, right? It will disappear, go in the trash can, rock and roll. This is a funny one. Five minutes to carry things up or down the stairs. <laughs> so every client that I have has a little pile on the second step of their stairwell, of the staircase, the stuff that's got to go upstairs. And then at the top of the stairs on the landing, there is the um, additional pile of things that have to come downstairs. And I, I go to a house and I start to go up the stairs and I'm like, this is stuff you need to go upstairs? And they say yes, and so I pick it up, take it upstairs. And you can see the look on their face like, what is she doing? <laughs> it's like, I'm taking it upstairs. That's where you wanted to go. That's why you put it on the stairs, right? I even have people, you know, sometimes you have the little cute little basket that sits on a stair so it has a little bend in the middle, and they fill the basket up. And I've watched people come around the corner put things in the basket, and then go up the stairs empty-handed. Like you're missing the point here. The whole point of the little basket is to carry it up. And so, then they pay me and they you know, are embarrassed that I go up and down the stairs with their stuff. If you have stairs and you are parking things on the stairway, the two stair positions, to move them between the floors, then you actually have to move them. And if it's worth parking on the stairs, it must be worth getting to the floor that you want it on, right? There must have been a reason you did it. So you don't have to take the whole mound. You go up and down those stairs a hundred times a day, right? You go up, you go, you dress, you come back down, you, you probably, and maybe, you know, 25 times a day, you go up and down the stairs, if you have stairs in your life. That's 25 times you could have taken one thing up the stairs and put it where it's supposed to go and gone in about your business and then picked one from the top landing and gone downstairs and parked it somewhere else the next time you came down. 
You don't have to do that whole mound in one trip. You just have to take one. <laughs> and if you just take five minutes to grab a couple of those things and go upstairs and disperse them before you do whatever you're going to do upstairs, you know, in a week, you won't have stuff on the landing anymore. It'll be done. If you're going to go to all the trouble to park it, you might as well go to the rest of the way to distribute it and make it go live where you really wanted it to go. <laughs> and how you make it only be five minutes is you don't do all, you don't do the 30 things that are sitting there, you do two and take two of them away. It makes it easy. Eventually you get there, right? The next one is five minutes to put a project away. We all do projects where we're madly, you know, crafty people, put out the craft project and they spread out all the components and they make a big mess and they're, you know, having fun playing in the hobby. And then they stand up and go to bed and come back and it looks like a bomb went off, right? Or you do it in the kitchen. Everybody has to make food, right? And you make a big pile in the kitchen and it's a big disaster. And if you then turn around and go away and ignore it, you get up the next day and there's the exploded kitchen, right? When you're in elementary school, the elementary school teacher in second grade and first grade makes you stop every 15 minutes. They're constantly changing the task, right? Because the kids' attention span is about this long. So every time they change the project, they tell the kids, okay, let's put this one away and we're going to do the next one. And the kids put the stuff away and they bring out the next one. Somehow we lose that along the way. Like we don't retain that as adults. And it's so useful and helpful, right? <laughs> to be able to Put one away while it's just one project and you know what it is and you know what parts of it's trash and you know what part of it you need to keep and you can box it up, box, 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 park it somewhere and then you come back later to deal with it. Do you guys want to go out there? Sorry, we have some wandering uh, attendees in the background here. So. <laughs> Do not touch those cookies. <laughs> <laughs> the group is claiming the cookies, man. <laughs> That's so funny. We don't build in project completion time to our project. Whether it's something like cooking every day or doing your favorite hobby or um, fixing the car in the garage or mowing the lawn. We tend to use all of the time for execution and no time for completion at the end. And if you do that five minutes of wrap up and reset, then when you're ready to come back to the hobby three weeks later, when it's time to pick up the project the next time, you can go and grab it, and in the meantime, you're not living with it spread all over everywhere, and it's not, pieces aren't floating away, and the cats aren't walking on it, and it's not being destroyed while you wait to get back to it. So take those five minutes on whatever you do and build in shutdown time, put away time, so that you go and wrap it up and box it up and park it. And then if you go and unpark it every night, who cares? It just means between one night and the next night, the pieces aren't getting spread around and lost. And you know, in my house, it's a necessary thing with two cats. Because <laughs> they want to walk through it and step on it, and I mess with beads. And that means little paws go stepping on the beads, and the beads get picked up and go walking along the table with them. <laughs> so you got to be able to put it away, and that's a, it's really an um, important thing to do. And it's five minutes to do it. You just have to take five minutes of your fun time and make it be cleanup time. And yeah, you know, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> this is an easy one. Take five minutes to handle today's clothes. So you only are wearing one thing today, right? Like I'm only wearing one dress. And if you change your clothes like Tommy does all the time, <laughs> then maybe you are, you know, putting away three things a day. But Putting today's clothes away Plus today. Plus all the other ones you tried on. <laughs> Plus all the other ones you tried on, yes. Okay, so, yeah, that's a separate problem. <laughs> if you are taking off your clothes at the end of the day, if you pay five minutes to hang up the clothes you have on, then that's that many less clothes on the floor, right? <coughs> it's that many less clothes, and you're making the decision. I wore this today, I smell bad, it's got to go in the laundry, it goes in the laundry hamper. You know, half the time what you're doing is putting in the laundry hamper. If it's nice clothes and it's okay and it's not August and you didn't sweat like a fiend all day long, you can maybe go hang it back up. But you're hanging up two things, one thing, you're throwing the bra on the dirty clothes, whatever. If you handle today's clothes today, it can be done in five minutes and you don't see the pile of clothes 
that then is on the floor forever until the next time you try to do the laundry, which the bigger the pile gets, the less time, the farther away laundry day gets, right? The bigger it looks, the less willing you are to do laundry. So you're helping yourself in the end, right? I, I have to tell a client story about that because this is, I had a couple, a couple, a client couple who were young, they were relatively newly married, they were both working, and one of them was on a day shift and one of them was on a night shift. And that was important because they were often, they were only on the weekends in the house together. And then during the work week, they were always in and out of the house at different times. So their solution to laundry was to buy new clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so the house was a trail of, it was like snow drifts up against the walls in all the living room and the dining room and oh my god, the closet. I mean the closet was just an explosion of clothes that went out to, down the three sides of the bedroom, in the bathroom. There was laundry hampers that were buried completely under a mound of clothes. And y'all gotta do some laundry. Well, we just buy new clothes. Mm -mm. <laughs> This, today's new per, today's new clothes are tonight's laundry. You only get to wear them once, and then they suddenly become laundry. And there's like no way laundry is not going to be a part of your life. So you have to get a grip about the laundry somehow, right? Most people, you grow up and your mom's doing the laundry, right? And there's some portion where some place where the mom tries to transition that. And some people get it, and some people don't. But if you don't do laundry frequently. <laughs> Then laundry day becomes this onerous all weekend chore that requires hours on end. So the better solution is to do smaller batches, like you know, when the hampers, don't let the hamper be this big, let the hamper be this big, and when the hamper's full, you go do one load and you put it away and you're done. I say that because people that have kids, like anybody that's had little kids, they do laundry every day of their life. They are doing endless streams of laundry all the time. When I go into clients' homes, it's a big deal to manage the laundry room and set it up so that they can do laundry all day every day because that's like nonstop. If you have two or three kids, forget it. The, the, the mother never comes out of the laundry room. She lives in the laundry room. And every mother knows this, right? Like it's just the drip. It's just what happens. No, the father does it in our house. No, well, good negotiation skills on your part. <laughs> Let me just say that. But it's really something that there's no getting around it unless you want to wear dirty clothes like you were in college, <laughs> right? And if you don't want it to suck up your whole weekend, then you have to do small loads more frequently. And we had to negotiate with this couple about neither one of them wanted to do the laundry and neither one of them wanted to like, well, that, okay, so let's split it up. You put the load in when you leave for work. And then when you come home from work, you can take it out of the laundry and put it in the dryer. It's like we had to break it into component parts to get compliance, to get them to work on it themselves. It's like, you know what, you are drowning already and you don't even have kids yet. Like if you guys are going to have kids, then y'all are never going to, like they're going to find you buried under the clothes in the house. It's, you're never coming out. So deal with today's clothes today. <laughs> don't wait until, you know, laundry day is an apocalypse. You want laundry day to be, you know, one load or two loads and then you're done for the weekend. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, whose uh, job was it to pick the, pick the laundry out of the dryer and put it away? <laughs> you know what? The, the husband didn't mind putting the clothes up. So he got the out of the washing machine into the dryer, out of the dryer, put it up. And she got the bring it down and put it into the wash. So she got sort of the lighter side version. But it was basically like, you guys need to be doing this every day. You need to be putting something in the laundry every day. And somebody comes out and does it on the other half. And so they each sort of got half. And, um, yeah, God only knows if they were caught up. <laughs> I doubt it, frankly. <laughs> but especially, especially if the laundry didn't get out of the dryer, so the stuff that was in the washing machine couldn't get to the dryer. And well, and that was why it's like, they, you know, they had to, like, they could only do one load at a time. And when she left in the morning and then he would come off of his shift at night, somehow it was like there was 12 hours between when one would go in and when would come out based on their shifts change. And, um, you know, it's like, yeah, y'all got to keep this circle up. And uh, like I said, it was amazingly huge in there. And I don't know how well they did, but I gave them a plan and it was up to them to execute. And you don't want to do that. I <laughs> mean, you don't want to be that person. <coughs> Five minutes to handle today's close today. 
five minutes to load or unload the dishwasher. So this is one of the things that we had to work out in my house. Um, my roommate is great and she cooks. And it's my job to clean after the cooking is done because I can't cook at all. I suck at it. And she doesn't like, she's happy to load the dishwasher and I end up loading it because I'm cleaning, but she will load it, but she doesn't like unloading it. So it's my job to unload the dishwasher. And I sort of don't pay attention to when it gets started, but then I'll go over to put something in it and it'll be locked and it'll be, oh, she ran the dishwasher. <laughs> and then I have to unload it. However you have to divvy up that task, some people hate putting stuff into the dishwasher, some people hate taking it out of the dishwasher. I don't understand what the, what the issue is about the dishwasher, but um, everybody has their preference about where they are in the chain of the dishwasher. <laughs> and so, you know, if you're the only one in the house and there's some portion of it that you hate, do it in five minute increments. When you come into the kitchen, take out the silverware and put the silverware up and walk away. You know, 20 minutes later, half an hour later, tomorrow, when you come into the kitchen, take the cups out and put them away. <laughs> Whatever it takes to unload, break it down into the smallest piece that it takes to load it up and to unload it and get it out of there. If you have the stamina to stand there and unload it all, awesome. If you can only do the bottom <laughs> and then you have to walk away and come back the next day and do the top, whatever works. It's a five minute thing you can do and everything that goes in the dishwasher is one less thing you have to wash by hand, right? It's going to take you five minutes to wash one pot and you can put all that, a whole bunch of stuff into the dishwasher in the same amount of time it takes you to wash down one pot. So you might as well, you know, put the five minutes in and be happy, right? Just my theory. I don't like washing dishes. This is a good one too. Five minutes to take donations to the car. This is another thing that surprised me when I started doing this work. I go into people's houses and I find the mound in the corner of the house that is designated to go to Goodwill or the church or the charity program or whatever the in your head where it's going to go. And it's been there for a year because the task never gets past getting it out of the house, right? So then it's, then it's like, you know what? I need to try those clothes on again because I don't remember whether, you know, it was a really good idea or not to get rid of those clothes. If you can get, take that collection as you make it and take the five minutes to go put it in the car, yes, it's annoying to unlock the back door and go get the keys and get into the car and, you know, put it away. You know, I tend to do this kind of stuff at 11 o'clock at night, so I'm going out and putting it out in the car in the middle of the night. But it's the kind of thing that if you can just get it in the car, <clears throat> the next time that you drive by one of the Goodwill places, you can stop and some people will come to the car and take it away from you. You don't even have to get it out of the car if you don't want. You can just point and say, here's these two bags. I find that some people get hung up with the idea of before they go to Goodwill, they have to find everything that needs to be donated and take it all at once because that makes it easier. But what it really does is it stalls the execution of that task so that you don't actually ever get to the end of the donation pile, then you never get to Goodwill. So it's much easier in my mind to take that two, the two small bags and take five minutes and put them in the car because you've only made two bags so far. And then on the other end, it only takes five minutes to unload the car as well. So in neither point of that distribution system is it taking you a lot of time to do it. So if you have to make 20 five-minute trips over the next six months to get all your donations out, does it really matter? It's like five minutes at a time and not irritating versus I've pulled every donation out of the house possible and it's going to take me an hour to load up the car and it's going to take an hour to unload the car and that's just annoying, right? So break it into smaller piles and get it out of the house. Get it out. Because I pick up people's donation piles a lot. And really I uncover the donation pile because it becomes a donation pile and then something else gets set on top of it that isn't a donation. And we have to uncover it to find the original, you know, oh, this is okay to let go of and it's now a year old and it's been there a long time. So good thing to get rid of the house, get out of the house in a hurry. Five minutes to clean out the fridge. <clears throat> This is a real easy one. And I guess, um, you know, I don't, Penny does that. I don't mind doing that. Some people don't want to get into the food. Does it, do you guys have problems with that? Does it bug you to clean out the fridge? Yeah. Yeah? It annoys you. So what about it annoys you? Explain that part to me a little. Uh, opening everything and smelling it. <laughs> it's 
<laughs> and so, and so you let it go for a long time, and then it's a big job. Yeah, I wait till the fridge stinks. Oh well, there you go. See, she's waiting till the fridge smells bad. Okay, so the shorter, faster version of that is to spend five minutes opening a few things, tossing that stuff out, and then stop it, so that you don't have to do the whole thing at once. You can go and pluck out obvious things and throw them away. And if it smells bad, then you know, give yourself the extra bonus of then taking the garbage out to the mm -hmm. out to the big can outside and put a fresh. If you want to be really clever, and then you can put a fresh thing in there so it doesn't smell at the house, right? Everything is easier to chew if you do it a little bit at a time. So if you're finding yourself not doing a task because you're not willing to do the whole thing, don't do the whole thing. Do five minutes of the thing, and get started. And you know, when you're annoyed and you snip three things and you're really mad. Then you know, stop and come back the next day and do three more. That's a good idea, right? It makes it easier. It works in the freezer as well, of course. And usually, the things that are in the freezer are really easy to throw away because they're a solid rock of ice <laughs> and they're really, really obviously dead. <laughs> makes it very easy. If you know, if the refrigerator is bugging you, stop and do the freezer and pluck a few things out of the freezer that annoy you. At some point, you will reach, you know, em emptiness. <laughs> you'll reach that, oh, I, this is all good, and there's going to be four things, and you'll be happy, right? Five minutes to clear out your purse or your wallet. So, your purse. <laughs> I got lots of eye rolls on that one. I wish you could have seen them. Um, this is something that people do. They carry around your purse. You carry around your purse or your wallet, and it's like your portable life, right? It has all of your important things. It's all the things that you deem necessary to be with you at all times. So that's the, you know, you got your purse in there, and you, you, your phone in there, and your makeup, and your money, and your IDs, and your uh, whatever the latest thing you're trying to return. And there's always a collection of things in there that seem really, really important to have next to you all the time. Like you can't leave them at home. So I forgot my phone, and I'm a little twitchy about it. <laughs> it's usually one of the things in my purse. What happens is that we add and add and add. We get receipts from things that we're buying and they all get shoved in the portable us container, the portable stuff container we take with us everywhere. And pretty soon you're carrying around a dead rock. You know, it's like a huge heavy weight that you're trying to move around. Um, and the wallet version of that is that you stuff, 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 and then you can't like fold the wallet anymore, right? It's like super. You have to sit this way. <laughs> <laughs> it's saying you have to sit at an angle because the wallet is so heavy, so dense with stuff in it. So it's easy to clean extraneous things out of your container. That's a five minute chore that you can do, which you reach in and pluck out all the pieces of paper that are floating around there and the dead Kleenexes and old medications and you know, fishing and all the extra makeup you put in so that you could go to that meeting and looking nice. You can pull all that stuff back out. It's very easy to reset a purse or a wallet if you give it five minutes to pluck some things out. And if it's not done in five minutes, you know, you can do some later, you can come back and do it tomorrow, you can add another five minutes. But basically, it's an easy reset to reclaim your purse or your wallet by pulling the stuff out. Some of the things you're gonna pull out are things you're gonna wanna keep. So I think sometimes people don't wanna do it because it's like if I take it out of the purse, then I have to do something with it, right? Yeah, so some of it is what I have to do is throw it away. And some of it is, I'm keeping this receipt for tax purposes. I need, this, I need to turn this in in case I am going to return it. So there's a couple of things that you, there'll be categories of things that you keep in your purse or wallet that are necessary to create a system for. Maybe you have a little Ziploc bag and all the receipts for things you might return go in the little Ziploc bag. And then, you know, occasionally when you clear out your purse, you pull them out and go, ate that, that's dead, not returning that, you know, you can thin the hurt, right? These two are going to tax file and I can go put them in the tax box. So it's a good it's a good way to feel like you accomplished something fabulous. And women that change their purses all the time, you always do it in a hurry, right? Like I've got to get out the door, but I'm not I'm taking the orange purse instead of the red purse. And so you you dump everything out and you snack that da, 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 and then the a purse that got dumped out is sort of half full and half empty and there's stuff that gets left behind and gets shoved on the floor or tossed in the closet. And then when I go to work at people's houses, I'm pulling purses out and going, what's all this in here? And, you know, oh, I was wondering where that lipstick was. I was wondering what happened to that key. You know, it was in the purse that got left behind. So resetting your purse is a good thing to do, and particularly if you change it all the time. I'm not that person, so. 
five minutes to clear out your car, clean out the car. There's something about the car that makes it feel like it's sort of a big version of a trash can. <laughs> Which I don't really understand because like we sit in it, right? And we invite our friends to sit in it. And so why do we not care that it's trash? But somehow everybody's sort of on the continuum of how trash they're willing to let their car get. And you know, you, you've all had to get into your friend's car and they've had to like sweep the stuff off the seat so you can sit down and you're putting your feet on a pile of stuff in the, in the well at the bottom, right? Yeah. So how you avoid that is when you pull up home and there's a trash can outside, you, you know, pluck up today's trash because you will have added trash today. Pluck up today's trash and throw it away on the way in or, you know, Keep a bag in there and stuff in the bag and take it in the house and throw it out. <clears throat> if you spend the five minutes every time you get out of the car at the end of the day, you're only dealing with today's trash. You're not dealing with five months worth of trash. And, you know, sometimes people, they go to clean the car and it requires an act of Congress. You know, they have to get out a hose and, a, you know, and it's a huge thing to clean it all out. But if you pluck out the paper and the stray and the whatever every day, it's, it's never a big chore. Now, why are you guys laughing? Because of your car? No, ah. no, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't usually, you don't have to sweep off the seat for me to sit down most of the time. No. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. At, at McDonald's and you're in your car mm -hmm. and you pay at the drive through mm -hmm. then you roll up just a few feet and they, all McDonald's have that trash can yeah okay what are they putting in that trash can they haven't had time to eat their food to have trash where what are they putting in that trash well, can? the food that they got the last time they went through the drive through <laughs> <laughs> they can't they can't they can't take your trash and yeah, i think the reason the reason they put a trash can there is because they get so many requests at the drive through to you know here take my trash and they can't do that for because of health codes you know yeah. There's so something in the cup just, holder for where you need to put the new Yeah. Right, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, right. Yesterday's drink is still in there, right? And I do that a lot. It's like, here's a convenient trash can. I don't even have to get out of the car. Let's take it. You know, this was from this morning. I'm throwing it out the trash can. It's good thinking. <laughs> right? It's, you know, if I'm in the drive-thru already, I'm pretty sure that there's something that I need to throw away, and I, you know, make use of it. And, you know, it's funny because you get that bag and the receipt, and they give you the receipt separately, right? And people always wad that thing up, but then they throw it in the car and not in the bag. Like, you're going to make trash any minute now. Why not throw it in the bag? And then when you throw it out, it goes out. Probably what was happening was when people pulled up, you know, they, they, they would just throw stuff out the window. And then yeah, that's true. Too. It makes their parking lot look terrible. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> trash management in the parking lot. <laughs> And so, clean your car so McDonald's doesn't have to clean their parking lot. <laughs> I, had a, I had a attendee to a speaking engagement once who said to me, my car is a wreck and it's always a wreck and it's, you know, it's just how it is and I'm just dealing with it and, you know, my father used to get so mad at me and I just am not willing to. And she was like 65. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that your dad has gone to God. And this argument about the state of the car is now really an old argument. And you can let go of that. But she was still having that fight with her dad in her head about the car. And so she was trashing the car in response to him, who was no longer there pressuring her. So... Um, I thought that was really interesting, and I, and I, and like all of us, there's always some emotional component to the stuff management, right? So if you find that uh, you have a little resistance, you might ask yourself, what, who am I resisting here? Do I really want to sit in a trash can? Do I really want to drive with all this stuff around? And you know, some people make that choice, and and I'm thinking that you'll be more comfortable and you'll find the experience more pleasant if there's less trash in there. I'm just saying. I remember I used to do that. I got a new car and it looked too yeah. nice and junk up. <laughs> there you go, right? There was your incentive, right? The new car is always a good thing. Yeah, and then it's like then you want to make the effort because it looks so pretty, right? Yeah, I remember. It's true. Okay, that's the car. Uh, five minutes to sort through magazines and catalogs. <laughs> I get a lot of response on that one. Everybody has magazines and catalogs, and depending on you know what your lifestyle is, what your online shopping lifestyle is, 
uh, how many things you subscribe to. That may be a small problem or a big problem. Um, my mother has discovered online shopping at Christmas. <laughs> and so at Christmas time, she gets this massive amount of catalogs. Because she's, you know, in October and November, she's going online to start buying Christmas presents. And then suddenly, she it's just like an avalanche. Like, you know, the, the chute that comes out of the spinning concrete thing, and it's just all pouring magazines into the front of her house. It's unbelievable. And it's one of the things that I do when I go at Christmas time, is I help her throw out all the catalogs. <laughs> because it's so overwhelming. And it's, and it's how they market. And there's, you know, there's marketing research to support when you get the piece of paper and you flip in the catalog, it makes you buy more. So they keep doing it because there's some support for I touch it, I see it, I want to order it. So there's not any, there's not going to be a fix from the marketing standpoint of those magazines and catalogs come in. You're going to have to fix it from your end. So five minutes to go through. If you're not doing it when the mail comes, like if you're not taking that catalog and going, I'm never going to read this, I'm not going to buy it, and, you know, throw it away. If it's one that you want and you want to flip it, you're going to go put it in a reading pile somewhere. But if you always just put it in the reading pile and you never take things out of the reading pile, eventually the reading pile is its own entity that has taken over a corner of your house, right? So you do have to spend five minutes to go and call that back down to stuff that is dead. And people always want rules about it. So the catalog rule is... If you have an old catalog and it's been replaced already by a new catalog, you got to throw the old one out. Because if it's in the, if they still sell it, it's in the new catalog. And if they don't sell it anymore, it's not in the new catalog. And it doesn't make any difference if it's in the old catalog. So <laughs> you got to get rid of the old ones when they're replaced. And um, filter them, please, for any that you don't think you're going to shop in. Don't tempt yourself. Don't keep them if you're not going to use them. Just straight up. And the magazines are a whole other conversation about how many subscriptions and how much time you have to read, but assuming it made to the reading pile, at some point you're going to have to go out and thin the reading pile, and you can usually do that in five minutes. So here's our bonus tip. This is a bonus tip because this is the reboot version, so I added a tip because some of you guys have heard this before. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Five minutes to unpack that box in the closet that's been there since you moved. Oh no. <laughs> never. Never? Never? <laughs> There's always a box or two or 12 that came through in the move. And there's sometimes there's like four or five boxes that have made it through several moves, right? You just keep moving the box without opening it. <coughs> so take five minutes and go pull one of those super ancient, completely marinated, probably full of stuff that you don't care a whit about boxes, pull it down and pull that stuff out and go through it. And it's so old and so unimportant at this point that it's likely it'll be super easy to get rid of almost everything in there. And you may find something that you thought that you lost in the move, right? I thought I lost that. Here it is. So you'll be able to get rid of a bunch of stuff and you may find a little present, a little surprise, something that you thought was lost forever and it really got stuffed in a box at the last minute that you never unpacked. So People think those boxes, I'll come back to you, people think those boxes are, they become sort of part of the wall, the closet. Like you stuff it in the floor, it goes up on a shelf, it goes into the garage or the attic, and it becomes part of the wall somehow, and you stop seeing it. But it's really valuable storage space. And if it's been there since you moved and you never needed it and you never unpacked it and it was never important enough to get out, you can probably take it out and make a really big hole in your storage area and get rid of a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter anymore. The end. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. What about boxes full of old photos? Old photo boxes. How exciting. Possible. So uh, photos are the dead media of our generation. <laughs> and <clears throat> printed photos, I mean, photo prints. Back before all of the electronic gadgets, we all took pictures to commemorate everything about our life instead of posting it all on Facebook. So. There's probably a lot of photos in there that are now not important. Like you took a whole bunch of pictures on your trip to the Grand Canyon and you are not the best photographer of the Grand Canyon out there, right? And so you probably don't need 150 pictures of the Grand Canyon with nobody in them, just landscape, right? 
photos are their own little problem and it's not a five minute problem. You're right. But you can make it a five minute problem if you take the box down and take out a handful of pictures and make keep talking <coughs> decisions with them. Like take a little handful and go yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Because some of them are gonna be people that you remember and care about, family members, whatever, and those are gonna be keep. And some of it's gonna be, you know, the Eiffel Tower without anything else. <laughs> you know? And your Eiffel Tower is not the best and brightest Eiffel Tower picture there is. So you can sort of let that one go. Or maybe it's people that are a couple generations ago and nobody in your family knows who these people are. Or they were friends, that, people that you knew from work back in the day that you don't remember their name now. You know, it's always amazing to me, There's the, the photo piles are so huge, but the portion that is still in your memory and still is valuable to you later is a much thinner piece of the pie. And people sort of don't want to take on the photos because it's going to be such a big project. It's like, I have to do the photos, that means I have to look at these 15 boxes and oh my god. So you don't want to think of it as that huge project. You want to take the box down and take a handful, mm -hmm. and, to, and your five memory. minutes is to do a little bit. It could be memory lane. It could be memory lane, right? And so, yeah. You, you get you, lost. You get lost. Yeah. And so you don't want to do the whole thing, right? You just want to do a little bit. So even if you do... Liquor. <laughs> sit down with the liquor, yeah. Howard says take some alcohol with your photos. <laughs> and sit there, and I think that's a great plan, actually. If you, if you do have the tendency to get lost, then that's all the more reason to take a smaller pinch of the photos and just open one pack and flip it. And you can then, you know, caress them and love them and remember them and still throw out the ones that don't, you know, like this isn't a good photo or this is out of frame or this didn't focus correctly or this is places I don't care about or these are people that I don't care about and these are the people that I do care about and then stop. So that you don't, it's like doing the, getting on Facebook and being lost for four days, right? You can either do it in little bites or you can go wandering off. So if you don't want to wander off, then only give yourself a little bit. And it'll be a project that, you know, you'll have to do slowly over time. Is there a good way to keep the slim portion that um, is important? Yes, I would go and buy some um, acid-free boxing. Um, they make photographic storage that is acid-free so it doesn't mess with the paper, it doesn't accelerate the deterioration of the paper, and you just designate a keep box. So after you filter, the portion that you're going to keep goes into the permanent box that they're going to be stored in. And you only want to do the yes or no question first and get through all your photos. And then you can go back and say, okay, do I want to take another step in this project? Do I want to try to organize them somehow? Do I want to... Um, you know, frame some of these. Do I want to put them in a binder? Do I want to make something pretty out of them? Do I want a scrapbook? So depending on how far, you know, there's a million things and you can go a long way with the photograph organization. And so it's really a matter of how far you want to go along that road. And you don't want to try to do it all at once, right? So get down your population to the stuff that you might want to do something with and then you can try to decide how far you're going to go. And in the meantime, they're in an acid-free box, so they're not deteriorating, they're staying safe, and you know everything's okay. I didn't know about, say, scanning them to the flash drive instead of putting them in a box or something like that. You can do that. If you're comfortable throwing them away after that, you can do that. Scanning takes a while, but so you don't want to scan everything. You want to scan the ones you want to keep. But yeah, people do that, absolutely. What I find, though, is that if people are into photographs, they scan them as protection as their backup and then they still keep the photographs. <laughs> They're not able to then let them go after they scan them. So it may not help you thin your, um, the amount that you have to contain. Um, but if you're okay with that, go for it. A flash drive is a lot, you know, holds a lot more pictures than your closet in a box, right? Okay, who else has a question? Five minutes, people. You can do anything in five minutes, right? How's your house? Now that your daughter's gone. <laughs> the upstairs is awful. It's just a disaster. <laughs> I just don't go up there. <laughs> That's awesome. That's very good. That would be a good five minute project. <laughs> Make yourself go up there for five minutes, pull a few things down, and go back down again. Out of the disaster zone. Right? 
<laughs> what else? Do you have any five minute projects for just the mountains of different kinds of paper? Paper. Paper is a really, paper, yeah. I mean, the concept is the same. Uh, five minutes is making it in a bite sized chunk, right? It's making it so that you can face it. If you can just make yourself do it for five minutes, you're making five minutes of progress as opposed to zero, right? So paper is the same thing. It's the same concept as handling your mail. If you go to an old pile and spend five minutes pulling trash out, the pile is that much shorter at the end of the five minutes. If, it, if it's really hard for you, some people find paper really dis, difficult. They can't face it. They have a hard time getting started. It, I have clients that it makes them very anxious to mess with paper and we have to sit down and okay it's going to be okay we're just going to you know we're just going to open a little bit you know, it makes them really anxious so depending on where you are on that scale you may need that five minutes and then walk away because you're getting anxious but if you can just pluck out the trash it will shrink and shrink and shrink eventually you'll get a collection of paperwork that you have to do something with but if you same concept as the photos if you have a keep box of paperwork and you can go through and say yes no yes no yes no with the paper the stuff that you say yes can go in the box and then you know you've already looked at it it's contained it's you write keep on the box and when you get to the bottom of your piles you can go and anything that you know that you kept is in one place and you can go back and try to organize that paperwork after the fact it's hard when you have a whole lot of paper laying around it's hard to try to simultaneously go through it and organize it and file it. Like that's something I can do, but it's hard for people that are already struggling with paper to try to do all those tasks in a, it together. So you wanna try to peel off a little bit at a time, make your decisions in little <laughs> chunks, make a keep pile, and then when, all, when you've gotten rid of all the extra, then you're dealing with a much, I promise you, you'll be dealing with a much smaller pile and then you can go through and make decisions. Here are five things for the insurance company. I'm going to put them all in the insurance file. I you think know. I need to take the five minutes to clean out the file cabinet so I can put the stuff there, in the That's a good one. Yes, absolutely. Five minutes to clean out the file cabinet. That would be good. And the thing is that the file cabinet is like the dead letter office, right? It goes into the file cabinet. And what's the stat? Like 80% never comes out again in offices, too. It's just it's like this place that we go in a park things that then just sort of start to petrify in the file cabinet, right? So it's a great place if you are finding, uh, facing the paper difficult, going to an old file cabinet and, and uh, emptying out a drawer that has a lot of old records in it will be so liberating because 95% of it will go straight in the trash. And you'll be like, woohoo! And then they'll be throwing stuff away like crazy and it'll feel like a big deal. And then you'll have this whole open drawer that you can put stuff in. It's a great place to start. Who has a question? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. What do you think makes people have a hard time making those decisions as to what to do as far as what to keep and what to throw away? <coughs> what makes us emotionally invested in a piece of paper in a Red Book magazine that we've had since May of 02? Right. You know, I just, I don't understand what it is about people like myself and probably most of the people here or they wouldn't be here. Why do we, what is it about us that we can't wrap our minds right. around things other people can just do in a snap and not Ed and I have had this conversation a lot, actually. And I think that part of it is that as you're going through paper, um, it represents managing your life. Here's the doctor's receipts, and here's the insurance paperwork, and here's the mortgage payment and the utilities. And it's all these things that you're responsible for. And yet some of us are not experts in the area of real estate, or we're not experts in the area of insurance, or we're not experts in the area of banking. And so we feel like we don't have the skill sets to review and make a decision that is trustworthy. You know, like we don't trust ourselves to be making a good decision because we don't think we know enough about what it is that we're looking at. So you err on the side of caution. It's like, I better not throw this away because it might be important because I don't know any better, right? And so people hang on to paper against the possibility that, you know, it might be super important someday. And there is paper out there that is super important to keep up with, but there's a lot of paper that isn't. And so really all you have to do is educate yourself a little bit enough to know what kind of papers to keep and what not. 
And if you Google that, you know, what kind of document should I keep? There's a million articles about that. Every organizer has written that list. Everybody, you know, financial person, accountant, they've all had that discussion. And you can listen to 50 people's opinion about what you should keep, which will tell you that there's 50 different choices, <laughs> but there's a general theme. And, you know, you'll feel a little bit more educated about it. I guess, you know, for people that don't go, you know, housewives, uh, somebody that doesn't run their own business, somebody who doesn't, you know, if you're going out and building a house all day long, your skill set may not be in paperwork, like somebody, a lawyer that's going to an office and dealing paper all day, right? So we all have our skill sets and things that we understand. And if it makes you nervous, it just means that you have to educate yourself a little bit to get comfortable with letting go. And the truth is, in this day and age, in the beginning of time, pre-internet, that paper was probably the only record ever of anything, right? But that ship has sailed. And there's now a million electronic versions of the documents that you're keeping. So with some exception, you can recover. And people, for instance, you know, their house burns down. And the, you know, the deed to the, the, the canceled mortgage to the house and the deed of trust and, you know, all those, your driver's license or your birth certificate, they all go up in flames. People can recover. It's a pain, right? It's a pain in the patootie. But it can be done. And now it's easier to recover because there's so much electronic data out there. You just have to get comfortable with the process of letting it go. And, you know, if it... it it's helpful to solicit information from experts, go read some articles, go get some lists, and then you know, do what makes you feel comfortable. You have to do what feels like an acceptable risk level to you. And for some people, you know, that risk, you know, you have higher risk aversion than others. And so, but still, you can train yourself to let go of stuff that is important. Practice makes perfect. <laughs> Back to you, yes. Also, tearing out the article you're interested in instead of keeping the entire magazine. Yes, you can do that. And then you have to do something with the article you tore out. Right. It's thinner. It is thinner. Yes, it's true. It's lost but it does flow more, something right? It gets right. lost in the pile. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're going to do that, if you're going to thin your magazines by tearing out the article you want, then I would go designate a box, a file cabinet, of something to slot them in so that they have some place to park. Yes, ma'am. Scanning of the computer files. And you can scan too, right? Scan the article instead. If you're going to get the scanner out for the photos, she's right. You can scan the article instead. And then you just have electronic clutter. <laughs> <laughs> but you can throw the paper away with good conscience and be comfortable about it, right? Yes, sir. There's actually, uh, I, I, I can try to find the name, but I can't, can't find it. But there's actually a web service now where you can create a, a single account and then connect it to all of the electronic, collect it, connect it to all of your online accounts where, you know, that keep electronic records. So it sort of pulls it all into one place for you. Mm -hmm. I'll see if I can find that and post it on the, on the meetup because for anybody who's trying to go <coughs> electronic with their record keeping, it could be a, a time, bit of a time saver. A good place to park everything. Yeah. yeah. Mint.com. Mint? That's about financial. Oh, that's that's not that's, financial. Uh, that's not everything. That's, that's just about financial documents. That might actually that might be the one I'm thinking of. Mint.com um, is for financial records. Mm -hmm. So you you go in and log into all your accounts, and it pulls bank records and credit card records. Anything that you go in and put in there, it'll pull that data in. But it's intended to be a financial online checking account kind of record bucket, right? With all the hacking, I think. Well, yeah, there's, you know, there is some risk level with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have seen same files, same table, same thing, cluttered everywhere, okay? I read it, clean it, next day you come again. It's like a history, you know, you have a burial ground. <laughs> articles, same thing. When you read those articles, You'll find only one or two lines that are real, that are that are remembering. Nothing, 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 uh, all others are just something not a real chunk. And and I think the important point to take out of that is if you find that you your default position is to save it to read later, 
because you might miss something. And when you go back and read it, you're consistently not finding very much. You should stop making that be your default position, right? You should go, you know what? Even if I miss that one line that's super important, I'll probably live. It'll be okay, and I can let it go. And it is a conscious, you know, paying attention to why paper gets added to the house requires you to focus your consciousness on how did that paper get there today. Oh, I tore out because I was going to read it later. Well, if you do that all the time and you never have time to read, then, you know, it's kind of a moot point, right? And one day you pick it up, it's a so much good pile, you just throw it in. Exactly. I'll do hard work on the end. Exactly. So. Okay, we're going to, um, I'm going to cut off because we're at 8 o'clock, so I'm going to turn, we're going to stop here and you guys hang and we will do the uh, raffle and stuff. Thanks for coming to watch. Bye. Bye.